The Jewish Intimacy series has been one interesting lecture after another for anyone that's involved in it, including myself. Tonight, the Ramban is telling us what he calls the master key, the master secret of food. But it's not what you think, because on one end, we have food, intimacy, afflictions, pain, demons, King Solomon, vegetables, reincarnation, a bunch of things that seem like they're unrelated. In fact, how are they all connected? And more than anything else, how are they all going to motivate anyone that pays attention to the end of this lecture to change their diet and change their life in a way they never thought is even possible? You're about to watch the most critical lecture you're ever going to hear about this subject because it's so motivating I want to watch it again. Enjoy it, share it, donate, and most importantly, remember, be holy. We're back here on our Tuesday night Jewish Intimacy Series. Tonight's you is certainly one not to be missed. It's going to have a lot of interesting things that uh, are going to make you think twice about uh, what you uh, put into your mouth and what you... Uh, take out of your mouth uh, and it's, it's certainly uh, a lot of new insights about food that the uh, Ramban has been teaching us over the last few weeks as this segment of the Jewish intimacy and how it affects intimacy uh, and tonight is going to take it even to a next level. Tonight's show is going to be for the Refuah Shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarar, Arav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, uh, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora. And uh, all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides also, it's uh, going to be for the Ilui uh, Nishmat of Arav Gershon Elistin, who Letzarenu left uh, the, uh, us today uh, at uh, age a little over 100 years old, Baruch Hashem, uh, lived a uh, life full of Torah, Kedusha, and uh, certainly a, a lot to learn, uh, not just uh, from the Shiurim, uh, that he gave uh, the different writings uh, and the advice, but just simply the way that he lived and how he himself treated food, which is certainly going to be something we're going to, uh, you know, connect to our shiur Bezal Hashem tonight. Uh, also, as a reminder for any of you that want to um, help us uh, continue growing the organization, uh, whether it's hiring more people that uh, are talented or it's a, uh, doing more distributions of books and CDs and USBs and all the other good stuff for free, you could donate on the uh, website bezratashem.org, bezratashem.org, or bhtorah.org. Uh, and also you can get some free stuff to uh, distribute to uh, your community. My personal favorites are these cards. We actually just got the uh, shipment in to Israel and the United States. Both of them are in right now. So uh, if you order these on the uh, website, there's a completely new version of these. Uh, Baruch Hashem. And uh, they come in a little compartment. You don't really have to do much. You just take one of these. You put it at the yeshiva or at the synagogue or a uh, supermarket or whatever other center. There's a lot of uh, people, Jewish people, that are uh, going to pass by. They take one of these cars. They watch one of the movies. And they could certainly change their lives. These cards are uh, amazing. They've helped quite a few people. Baruch Hashem, we've uh, given out hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, there is a new order that just came in. Uh, so uh, you go to the Kiruv store, which is bhkiruv.org or kiruvstore.org. Both are the same website. Kiruvstore.org is k-i-r-u-v-s-t-o-r-e.org. I think we're probably the only... Uh, organization, especially Jewish organization, that uh, constantly markets our free stuff, uh, where we pay for the stuff, we pay for the shipping, we pay for everything. The only thing you need to do is just give it to people. Uh, and that's, Bo Hashem, also part of uh, the reason of why we ask for partners, for anyone that wants to be on the giving end, uh, not just the receiving end, but many people are both. They uh, give when they can, and they obviously uh, distribute in the community. And they're really uh, uh, fantastic partners. So anyone that wants to get some of these USBs, uh, the cards, there's also the uh, new car magnet. And uh, Bezat Hashem, in the next uh, couple of days, uh, I'll be putting my new book on the uh, site as well. Uh, anyone that wants to distribute my new book, it's in Hebrew only. It's about each uh, parasha in the Torah. 
a lot of good insights in there. Uh, so anyone that wants to give that out in the community could also uh, uh, get it from the uh, same store. Bezat Hashem. Uh, anyone that wants bigger orders uh, of stuff, if I know you, meaning that I know you have a history, you've given out a lot of stuff before, then you could order more than what the site restricts because usually we restrict people to get only 20 books at a time and uh, uh, I think 10 or 20 of these things at a time. But if I know you and you want a bigger order, then uh, you know, uh, then I could uh, more than happy to, uh, to do it. Just simply place an order, but then text me and uh, let me know how much you actually want. And we'll try to do our best to, uh, to give them out. Uh, so with that being said, we have uh, Baruch Hashem, a lot on the plate. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue the teachings of the Ramban about Jewish intimacy. Now, over these last several weeks, the Ramban has been taking us to a uh, different world uh, than what we're typically used to when it comes to uh, the topic of Jewish intimacy, or any intimacy for that matter. Generally speaking, uh, when uh, people talk about uh, you know uh, intimacy, they're talking about things that are uh, based on the act itself. But we've already seen since the beginning of uh, this series 25 lectures ago uh, that there is a spiritual preparation, a physical preparation, a mental preparation, uh, but we also have a uh, dietary preparation. And uh, this dietary preparation is not just to uh, stay away from, uh, you know, uh, foods that, are, you know, make a person smell bad or they could actually cause harm to the body, whether it's a uh, uh, different types of... Uh, uh, dysfunctions in the body, things that make a person uh, sweat too much, all types of things that are uh, not ideal uh, for uh, for the uh, you know the the intimate act. Uh, but uh, more than that, we're seeing that the Ramban is telling us that there's a lot more that we need to know uh, about food than we do simply because if a person does not know some of the details that we've learned over the last few weeks from the Ramban about food, it's very easy for a person to live their entire life with a, uh, a question, a question about God altogether. Uh, why are we allowed to eat animals? Uh, you know, why uh, uh, the, aren't the, the liberals right? You know, all these different liberals today that say that, uh, you know, people should live off of vegetation and, uh, you know, let animals uh, live freely and not eat them. It's, they even call it uh, vicious to eat animals. Why is that uh, not the right uh, you know, opinion? Uh, why does the Torah actually even uh, command us to eat specific types of animals? Why not every animal? So we've discussed a lot of these things over these last several weeks. Tonight, we're going to go into another aspect of it. And the, uh, the Ramban now is uh, going to do something that uh, he hasn't done before, which is he's simply calling this the master key secret. And he says as follows, and I'm giving you a highly important key, a master key. Know that being that the uh, matter is as what we said, meaning that the, uh, uh, everything that we've said in regards to uh, forbidden foods, some food is obviously forbidden uh, to the Jewish people because the Torah forbids it. You know, you're not allowed to eat pork, you're not allowed to eat non-kosher meat, shellfish, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, bugs, everything that's obviously not kosher, we're forbidden from eating. But he's also talking about forbidden foods that is uh, not necessarily forbidden because of the kosher laws, but rather it's forbidden because it's simply bad for you. Either it's too fatty or it's something that is going to make you too hot. Your, your, your body is going to uh, have to work extra in order to digest this food, and this is the uh, the worst thing you can do before the act of intimacy, uh, there are certain foods that will make you smell bad. There are certain foods that will make your body cold, uh, and that's also very bad for the act of intimacy. Uh, but uh, more than anything else also is to know when to eat, uh, because it's not good to eat uh, close to the act of intimacy itself. But here he's telling us that aside from all of what we've discussed, there is a highly important master key, meaning there is a secret that is unlike anything else. In Hebrew, he calls it mafteach gadol, a big key. Know that being that the matter is as we have said, the blessed Holy One did juxtaposition in his Holy Torah the section of a woman shall have seed 
and give birth to a male in Leviticus 12.2, close to the section on forbidden foods, and said to differentiate between the impure and the pure, between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten in Leviticus 11.47. And he did also a juxtaposition verse near to a uh, woman that shall conceive and give birth and place this near the section describing the leprous afflictions in Leviticus 13. And these three verses show wondrous secrets. Before we reveal these secrets, a person has to understand that when it comes to the Torah, unlike all of the other books that are out there in the world, whether it's the New Testament or what we like to call False Testament, that's full of falsehood, full of nonsense, full of contradictions, mistakes, uh, even uh, uh, geographical errors uh, that unfortunately is fooling billions of people uh, today and many, many more billions throughout the generations. Or it's the Quran that uh, has the same level of uh, mistakes, contradictions, uh, you know, historical mistakes, all types of mistakes that literally uh, a five-year-old yeshiva student can figure out. Uh, or it's all of the other types of teachings, whether it be Buddha, all types of uh, uh, cults and religions that, uh, that tell you things that are, in essence, contrary to the Torah. The Torah itself is the Word of God, not because I said it, but rather because the Torah proves itself. And in Rav Ephraim's new book, uh, which Bez Hashem will be distributing as well, in these coming weeks, uh, also for free like everything else, the same price. Uh, In this book, he has a section called Ochachot, proofs. And there are many different types of proofs that a person can go into, whether it be the scientific proofs, which we noted in our uh, different films, uh, one of them being the, uh, The Signature of God, highly recommended film for anyone that is new to the world of Torah or ha- simply hasn't watched it. It's called The Signature of God. You could find it on our app or on a, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, or uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the movie that we made uh, called uh, Torah Science and Ancient Wisdom, also about an hour or so uh, worth of uh, scientific proofs of the Torah, scientific proofs of God, Uh, And more than anything else, if a person delves deep enough into the mitzvot, into the actual mitzvot that we have in the Torah, you will see that the mitzvot themselves are the greatest proofs that exist. One of them, for example, is in uh, this week's parasha. We have parashat Naso here in the United States. We're at parashat Naso. In Israel, there are one parasha ahead of us. There are Baalotecha. But in Parashat Naso, we have a extraordinary, uh, an awesome event taking place where there is a woman that's suspected of cheating on her husband. And there's this, obviously I've made many lectures about this. We're going to discuss this deeper uh, tomorrow uh, in our lecture of uh, questions and answers. But really one of the things that Rabbi Ephraim brings is that this, like many other mitzvot, was easily provable. Why? Because this is a public display where the woman that is suspected of committing adultery is brought to the Bet Mikdash. There are thousands upon thousands of people watching this whole charade happening. This whole thing is happening. And if she cheated, if she committed adultery, she literally turns green, blows up and blows up and dies. In front of everybody. In a most gruesome, horrific way. Now, the Chida has a uh, famous story about him that was told by the eyewitnesses where a woman that was suspected of cheating, uh, you know, the the Chida understood that uh, she did cheat and he said that her husband is forbidden uh, from staying with her. But there wasn't two uh, witnesses to see this. So the other Dayanim said, how did the Rav conclude this if we don't have eyewitnesses? We, Allah doesn't allow such a thing. Later on that night when uh, the, um, the, uh, the Chida asked this woman to come to his, uh, to his uh, study, for anyone that didn't hear me tell this story, I think recently in Hebrew, uh, she came and he started reading this very same Torah portion that we're reading this week. In Parashat Nassau, about the 
a wayward woman, and as he's reading it, without touching her, without giving her anything to drink, without saying anything to her, he just simply used his holy mouth to say the holy words of the Torah, and the same exact thing that happened to the wayward woman happened to this woman for other people to see. Her eyes bulged out, she turned green, and she literally blew up and died. Now, this is a famous story, you could actually find it in multiple Sfarim that other Chachamim have written. One of them is actually uh, a bio uh, of the Chida, which is really more like a journal uh, of the Chida, where he wrote about the different, uh, uh, his different travels. Uh, segments of it were actually even translated to English. But the point being is, is that this is 2,000 years almost after the Bet HaMikdash. Now, if we go back 2,000 years, we go back 2,500 years, we go back 2,700 years, and there is a woman that did what she did, but there's no proof. And in fact, this woman is also not so sure about whether the Torah is from God, or maybe Moses wrote it, or maybe the, the, the Rabbanim wrote it. You know, she's not really sure, but she keeps quiet because it was perhaps a uh, not exactly the greatest thing to unveil to anybody. Now, if she wanted to excuse herself from being religious, all she had to do is simply go to the Bet HaMikdash, drink the water, do the whole thing like everybody else does, and if she did cheat, but she didn't die, she would just tell everybody, listen, I cheated, and according to the Torah, if you cheat, you drink this water, you blow up and die, well look, I'm alive, nothing happened to me. And therefore, there would be literally a mistake in the written Torah. Now, the Bet HaMikdash was around, we had two Batemikdash. The first one was for 410 years, the second one for 420 years. In between them, after the destruction of the first Betamikdash and until the second one was built was 70 year difference. So in so many words, 900 years, 410, 420, and 70, 900 years here, that you have in essence the times of the Betamikdash until the third one, Bezat Hashem, will be built soon when the Mashiach arrives. Out of all of these years, 900 years that you have a Bet HaMikdash, or 400, uh, 830 to be exact, certainly there were multiple women that were brought to the Kohen. There are stories in the Gemara, in Masechet Sota, in uh, different uh, words of the sages, where different women went to the Bet HaMikdash because their husband had the spirit of jealousy enter him because he realized something is wrong with this woman. He told her not to enclose herself with a, uh, a guy that's not her husband. She did it anyway. He thought, he thinks that maybe perhaps she took it too far. And he brought it to the Bet HaMikdash. In a period of 830 years, this happened quite a few times. This happened quite a few times. I mean, just imagine how many things happened in the last year. In your town, wherever your town is, in the court system, when it comes to marriage and divorce. Just imagine how many things, accusations, divorces, proofs of, of, of adultery, you know, all types of things happen in, in your local court system that certainly has fewer people than the Jewish people were at the time of the Bet HaMikdash. How many times people show up to court every day with all types of statements, all types of proofs, all types of accusations, each day? Calculate not just your town, but your city. Calculate not just your city, but your people, your entire people. If you're Asian, all the Asian people. If you're Indian, all the Indian people. Whatever it is that you are. Imagine. Imagine you have all of the black people all of the arab people all of the french people all of the different types of people have to report to the court about their marriage in a single day obviously you're going to have quite a few questions up there over a period of a year many more over a period of 
830 years, there's going to be a lot of events. Now, certainly, the Jewish people didn't have as many as what the people that don't follow the Torah, but the point being is that over 830 years, if there was even a single time, one time, that a woman cheated and thereby drank the water, went through the whole process like everybody else, and didn't die. This would be reported everywhere, not just by the Torah itself and the sages, but needless to say, the heretics, the anti-Torah people, the Sadducees, the Batchesees, the Christians, uh, the, 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 all of the people that simply hate the oral Torah, or really they hate every part of the Torah, but they claim that it's only the oral Torah, somebody would report it somewhere that, oh, after 830 years of a pristine track record that every woman that cheats blows up in public and dies, uh, one woman escaped death today. Nothing happened, even though we have eyewitnesses that she did cheat. Somebody would report this. This would be written somewhere. And in fact, there were women that tried to cheat the system. Where twins, identical twins, one that cheated and one that didn't, switched, went to the Bet HaMikdash. The twin sister that didn't cheat went to the Bet HaMikdash pretending to be the one that did cheat. Nothing happened to her. But as soon as she came home in multiple stories, one of them, she came home and the sister was already dead. Literally, when she drank the water, it affected the sister already back home. In another story, when she came home and she hugged her sister, apparently the, the, uh, the air that came out of her mouth had the holiness of the water on it and she blew up then. The point being is, people have tried to beat the system. And no one did. So this in itself is a mitzvah. It's one of the things that happened. And out of all of those centuries, not a single time is there a report of someone saying, I beat the system. So this is a very important part to know as a prerequisite that when you see things in the Holy Torah, this is not a comic book or history book or some book that you cannot uh, take everything into consideration, including not just what it says, but where it says what it says and what's next to it, what's before it, what's after it, what's around it, who said it, everything matters. So the Ramban's secret, back to him now, the Ramban is telling us we have a master key. This master key connects Jewish intimacy, diet, with something extraordinarily high level that if one were to understand it, they would never live the same again. They would never eat the same again if they care about their future. And he says it all begins with our verse that we've mentioned in this series multiple times in Parashat Tazriya, in Leviticus chapter 12, verse number 2. Deber al bnei Yisrael emor, isha ki tazriya veyalda zachar vetamah shivat yamim kime nidat tovata titma. Says, speak to the children of Israel, saying, when a woman conceives and gives birth to a male, she shall be contaminated for a seven day period as during the days of our separation infirmity, she shall be contaminated. So here we have a verse in a Torah. It's about purification laws, not necessarily uh, all that we can apply to today because we don't have the Bet HaMikdash, but generally speaking, the uh, average woman out there uh, that uh, gives birth, by the time she actually stops bleeding from the delivery uh, you know, she would have already been pure even according to the uh, standards of uh, the Torah from uh, when we were able to purify ourselves at the Bet HaMikdash. You had to wait, you know, a certain amount of days and so on for male, for female. 
But point being is, is that the Ramban says, start here. Start here with a verse that says, when a woman conceives. Chapter 12. Notice that this woman conceives, chapter 12, is right after the end of chapter 11, the last verse in chapter 11. Meaning we have chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is what says what it says here. But look what it says in chapter 11. The last verse, not even the beginning of the verse. Not even the beginning of the chapter. The last, last verse, meaning it's one verse next to the other. They're next door neighbors. The verse says, the word of God is, to distinguish between the contaminated and the pure. And between the creature that may be eaten and the creature that may not be eaten. Here the Ramban is telling us, notice we talked about forbidden foods. This is not just an idea. This is a reality in the world that God created where the teachings and the secrets about conception, about what will come out of this intimate act, starts with the food the forbidden food the permissible food what animal all of that as the Torah says but it's not just there he says if you look at the beginning of chapter 13 again with 12 we'll go back one that's the forbidden foods we're at 12 that's the conception chapter 13 Beginning of chapter 13. Torah says, Hashem spoke to Moshe and to Aaron saying, if a person will have on his skin of his flesh a se'et, which is a, a certain, a, uh, a um, amount or sapachat it's a certain type of, of uh, skin disease a baheret and it will become tzara'at affliction on the skin of his flesh he shall be brought to Aaron Kohen or to one of his sons the Kohanim here we see that the different types of afflictions are discussed in chapter 13 it's not just the affliction of tzara'at, which many translate to leprosy, which it's really not leprosy, because tzara'at is both a physical and a spiritual disease. It's a uh, different spots that can actually start even on the walls of the house. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to start on the body. Then it appears at different parts of the body. It could be on the head, it could be on the arms, it could be different parts of the body. There's different colors to it. It's a, a whole uh, uh, teachings in itself. But... This is not just talking about tzara'at. This is talking about all afflictions. All different types of afflictions on the flesh itself. The Ramban says, you have conception. Before it, diet. After it, affliction. This is the master secret, says the Ramban. HaKadosh Baruch Hu specifically and precisely put these three different key topics right next to each other in order to unveil to us wondrous secrets. And he placed the verse and the woman shall be, have seed in the middle to inform us that if a man abstains from the bad foods, he will have proper, holy, pure sons. And if not, great harsh afflictions will befall him due to the drop of the seed which has been derived from those forbidden and abhorred foods. Hashem arranged this all in order to inform us that a man must sanctify himself also through food which are proper when near the time of the union, intimacy, in order that the seed 
that will be coming out of his body will be clean and pure and balanced between north and south, as I have said. Here the Ramban is now taking things to a completely different world. We've learned the importance of food. We've learned the differences as far as north and south, where the bed should be, the, the, the temperature in the room, uh, the, uh, how the, the certain foods warm the body, how certain foods cool the body, how certain foods heal the body, how certain foods can actually help intimacy, help seed. We mentioned saffron. We mentioned the uh, 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 different types of uh, uh, things that are very nutritious, but uh, uh, and not just nutritious for you, know, you getting skinny or fat, but rather nutritious on the, on the intimate aspects of things. All of that we've discussed. Here he's saying something completely different. Here he's telling us, if you follow this set of instructions, you're doing yourself the biggest service in the world. Because if you follow this regimen, you are now, just by simply sanctifying the way you eat, how you eat, when you eat, what you eat, that in itself will produce a certain type of seed that's clearer, that's purer, which thereby, by default, by default, will produce better children that are more put together, wiser, on the spiritual and the physical aspects, healthier. But if not... He does not hold any punches here and he simply tells you how it is. A person that simply lives to eat instead of eating to live, eats whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. One of these people that literally you feel bad for the animals that are still alive because he's most likely going to eat all of them. Sometimes you're scared to even, you know, come to him for, uh, you know, to to uh, for an invitation for dinner because you're afraid he may eat you also. And heaven forbid if it's a woman that eats like that, because unfortunately there are certain women out there that also they eat literally like they've never eaten before, even though she just finished our eighth meal for the day and it's only 11 o'clock in the afternoon. Some people literally live to eat and they take things way too far, not just the, the, the quantity, but the amount of attention they put into it, how much time, how much effort, Everything has to touch the the, 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 the palates of their tongue in a certain way. The Ramban is telling us healthy food is not just healthy for you physically. Healthy food is also the type of food that you eat, when you eat it, how you eat it. And if you simply ignore all of this, he says, great harsh afflictions will befall these people due to the drop of the seed which was derived from those forbidden and abhorred foods. In so many words, you eat forbidden foods that are either forbidden for the reason that the Torah has said, that it's not kosher. Uh, it could be uh, the, the, the cockroaches of the ocean, uh, what they call uh, uh, the, uh, the, fruits of the uh, fruits of the ocean, whatever it is, all those little cockroaches that people eat, the lobsters, or you eat all the non-kosher fish, you eat the sharks, you eat the seals, you eat uh, pretty much anything that moves, and if it doesn't move, you push it, then you eat it. You eat everything that's out there, you eat all the disgusting uh, animals that are forbidden, the pigs and the rats and the cats and the bats and all of the different things that uh, people eat today because they want to eat something exotic. That food produces problems. And we're not talking about physical health problems only and diseases We're talking about it produces problems that will last beyond the lifetime. Why beyond the lifetime? Because let's just say somebody ate a, uh, I don't know, one of those bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches. They ate pig with cheese and thought nothing of it. And it's breakfast. Now, aside from it being forbidden... For Jews to eat such foods, you're not allowed to eat milk and meat together. In fact, if you eat meat, you have to wait six hours before you consume dairy products. If you consume dairy, you could simply wash your mouth and then consume meat. But then after that, you have to wait six hours until you consume dairy again. To eat them together is always forbidden. To cook them together is always forbidden. 
you're not even allowed to sell it. If you're a Jew. If you're not a Jew, enjoy eating it, preparing it, do whatever you want. But again, there's also a certain benefit to eating kosher food even if you're a non-Jew, as we've heard in the previous lectures. But if, let's say, for example, a clueless Jewish person eats non-kosher bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, gets it from McDonald's for $1.99, somehow the cows are cheaper to the point where you could simply sell them for, for almost free, and people still think it's a cow, and it's also a pig, and it's also the cow's milk, all in one sandwich for a dollar. Fine. He eats it. He made a bunch of sins. Not kosher meat, milk and meat, bunch of sins. Now, he went home. He didn't do anything. He thought about it. He said, you know what? What kind of Jew am I? How could I be eating stuff like this? When my ancestors literally were willing to sacrifice their life just to avoid eating these things. As we know from the one of the stories we said recently about the, uh, the founder of the organization, Arachim, who literally did tshuva and changed his entire life while he was online in a meat store looking to buy pig meat in Israel many years ago because he was completely secular but then he thought of the story about his grandfather who died under the nazi murderers because he was not willing to eat pig he said how could it be that my grandfather is willing to die just not to eat pig and i'm here online free to eat whatever i want but i choose to eat pig how could that be and then obviously that transformed his life and transformed many lives thereafter So let's say a person thinks like this. He has a moment of enlightenment. And he thinks, you know what? I'm not going to eat anymore. This non-kosher food. From now on, I'm going to eat kosher food. I'm going to watch Rabbi Reuven on the internet. And and, uh, anytime he has a live uh, event, I'm going to attend and do tshuva and keep Shabbat and keep kosher and put on tefillin. And he's going to transform his life. Fantastic. Everything is good, right? Now, let's say that happened the sins over hashem forgives him he truly repents everything is good life continues and from now on he eats kosher the damage is contained now on the other hand if let's say he did this and he ate and he didn't do tshuva that day In fact, he didn't do tshuva for another six months or even a year. But in the process of this six months or a year, he continued eating the pig. He continued eating the rats and the cats and everything else that they sell out there. And of course, he has a wife, so he was intimate with her. Now, because he ate that food, that food will turn into blood that is him and the ultimate the purest aspect of blood in essence the 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 potion of blood is the seed the best part of it is the seed so that food becomes the seed that seed brings a baby to the world that baby doesn't really care that the father did tshuva and changed everything even if it was a day later even if it was an hour later needless to say if it was a year later why the seed already came in the seed already connected and got married to the egg produced the embryo nine months later that seed is a brand new baby running into the world and guess what that seed produces a certain type of baby a baby that will have many damages we're not talking about physical damages like he's going to be autistic or he's going to have uh uh, he's going to be blind or deaf no we're not talking about that what the ramban is talking about here is that he's talking about the harsh afflictions that could be that but much more so 
could be spiritual afflictions could be mental afflictions he could be a slow learner he could be someone that is mentally deficient in one way or another he could be oh he could have in so many words no limitation to the type of afflictions that he could have why because just like the Torah itself connects the three parts where it tells you if you're going to conceive consider this the food you ate forbidden not forbidden what animal what not animal and then the afflictions that will come thereafter if you eat what's forbidden those afflictions are not just tzarat, but literally there's no limit to the afflictions so the Ramban says that if a person completely ignores the holy words of this Igeret HaKodesh he is in so many words acquiring for himself a permanent problem because even if he repents even if he changes that baby is already in the world he now has to deal with that now you may not notice it uh, unless it's a physical damage uh, on that baby he may not even notice it for the first several years all babies are cute they all grow up and they're cute and they smile and they laugh and they say baba and everybody thinks that means abba or if he doesn't have an abba then it really means ima you know and that's whatever you, the parents want it to mean and everybody's excited and it's all cute it's all wonderful it's a big gift but as the baby grows up as the personality develops you start to see more and more developments of certain things in a positive way and certain things in a very negative way and as the baby grows up to be a child there's further development and all of a sudden you despite you spending all of your waking hours trying to earn a living so the baby can go to the best yeshiva to the best school to the best education the kid simply cares less about it and drops out without even letting you know you find out only six months later when the report card simply doesn't show up because the kid doesn't show up anymore you find out that the kid has been living on the street you find out that the kid has addictions that your family has never even known or heard before you find out that this child has all types of inclinations and desires that are unbeknownst to you it wasn't the way you were brought up you didn't think this way you weren't raised this way where did he get this from where did she get this from what is this kid and you're thinking wait but i did tshuva if i was still secular and i gave a birth to a puppy then yeah what do you expect you act like a dog you breed puppies what's this what's the big uh, surprise but if a person preserve himself contains himself is honest is monogamous is 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 protecting whatever he can protect learning whatever he can learn doing all the good things he figures he's gonna bring you know holy beautiful little Moses is everywhere but all of a sudden he doesn't have Moses he has Korach Bilam Balak why oh, where, who are these things where do these people come from he starts blaming the wife she starts blaming him no no this is from your family he acts like that because of your family no what my family your father and they start arguing why because they blame each other about why what happened with this kid and guess what it's not his family it's not your family it's both of you why everything that happened before that seed married the egg the Ramban says that problem doesn't go away just because you decided to keep some Torah and read and observe Shabbat in fact even if you are religious your whole life you never desecrated Shabbat you never ate pig you never killed people you were religious your whole life you didn't eat pig but you eat like a pig you didn't eat the things that are forbidden but the amount that you ate the way that you ate the times that you ate the behavior is forbidden you've made the permissible forbidden and the forbidden permissible 
And guess what? That too produces afflictions. So the Ramban here is not sugarcoating everything. I mean, literally, if you read the book yourself, I'm reading you word for word. I'm obviously elaborating on his points to give you some food for thought of what these words mean. But you're seeing here that the Ramban says clearly, if a man abstains from the bad foods, he will have proper, holy, pure sons. But if not, great, harsh afflictions will befall them due to the drop of the seed which was derived from those forbidden and abhorred foods. This is literally the greatest secret you can possibly think of. Because all of the other things that we do, generally speaking, you think about the mitzvot. All the mitzvot that we do. You put on tefillin, that's on the outside. You put on talit, that's on the outside. You, uh, you pray, you go to synagogue, that's on the outside. You read, that's on the outside. Shake the lulav and etrog, outside. But the mitzvah of eating, you're bringing the outside in. The mitzvah of breeding, meaning intimacy, especially holy Jewish intimacy, is bringing the in out. So you're taking the out in with eating and with intimacy, whatever is in you goes out. So the Ramban here is warning us. He's telling us there are two great mitzvot. The mitzvah of food enters the body. The mitzvah of children and intimacy comes out of the body. If you take this into account, it could literally change your life. Whatever happened, happened up till this point. But moving forward, it could change your life. Because what you produce is not something that simply goes away at the end of that night. What comes out of that is something you have to live with forever. So, the Ramban here said, this is how you learn Torah. This is how you understand, oh, conceiving is here, forbidden foods is here, afflictions is there. What's the reason? This is the reason. You have to connect all of the points and understand this is the reason. This is why Hashem put this out of 304,805 uh, letters in the Torah, Hashem chose to put these letters right next to each other. These three mitzvot right next to each other. He arranged all of this in order to inform us that man must sanctify himself also through food. Even more so if it's near the union, near the intimate act. Now the Ramban repeats again something which is going to take us to a mystical part of the Torah that I know many people like, myself included, but has a lot of weight. I've informed you that according to the food, will be the blood which is formed from it. And according to the blood will be the seed. And according to the seed will be the child. You know already what we have said that a horse will not give birth to an eagle and not to any other animal. And no other creature will come and breed a man, nor from a, a wheat is not going to create lentils. Therefore, it is said that a dirty and coarse seed can only give birth to a despicable and abominable man. As it is says by King David in Psalm 58 verse 4, the wicked are estranged already from the womb. 
Here, the Ramban, again, does not skip a beat, does not sugarcoat anything. If he said this, in most synagogues in the world today, they would throw him out. If I said this, in synagogues today, they throw me out. Why? No one wants to hear the truth. Unless you chase the truth. Especially if the truth hits home. Like this. Truth that you cannot dispute. This is a early sage. This is a Rishon from 700 years ago. It's not like, you know, we came up with some ideas and it makes sense. This is indisputable Torah. So here we have the Ramban telling us this is the basic foundation. This is the outcome. Now, one of the things that he repeats is that this food will turn into blood and then thereby seed and thereby a child and a horse will not give a birth to a bird or eagle. In so many words, you're going to produce what you are. If you are elevating yourself to a state of holiness, you'll produce holiness, you'll produce good. If you act despicable, you'll produce something despicable. Now, in one of the verses in the chapter 13 of Leviticus, where it talks about the afflictions, the afflictions are called in Hebrew negaim. Negaim, or a, this is plural, in a, nega is a, is a single affliction. What is an affliction? What is this affliction? Where, 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 where else do we see this word affliction? We heard that King David mentions it. Let's see what else King David can tell us. The book of Samuel. Samuel 2, chapter 7, verse number 14. King David is being told by the Navi, the Navi Natan, that the word of Hashem is that King David is not going to build the Bet HaMikdash. He'll build the foundation, but he won't build the Bet HaMikdash, but he will have a son. Through his marriage with Bathsheba, that will build the Bet HaMikdash. But Natan Navi doesn't stop there. He tells King David a very important message, and in so many words, a warning. A warning for that son. Ani lo le'av, v'hu yeli le'ben, asher ba'avoto be'echriach... I shall be a father unto him, and he shall be a son unto me, so that when he sins, I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the afflictions of human beings. Afflictions. Now, if somebody reads the Torah, like the people that read storybooks they read things literally okay just didn't say anything new okay so he'll be chastised he'll get afflictions from people fine god will rebuke him great but that's not how the torah works delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it here it says again the same word nega afflictions What's afflictions? Is it tzarat? No, we already know it's more than tzarat. Is it skin disease? Is it physical disease? We already know it's more than that. What else is it? Why does it say afflictions of human beings? Who else would it be from? Rashi Alamakom says, Nega. Nega is demons. Akadosh Baruch Hu will rebuke the son of David, Shlomo, with demons. Whenever he doesn't act well, whenever he doesn't do well, whenever Hashem needs to rebuke him, the damage will come through demons. 
Where do we see this? Talmud Bavli, Gemara Masechet Gitin, page 67b, Mishnah, says, Mishach Azo Kurdiakus, Vamar Kitvu Get Leishti, Lo Amar Klu. If a person was seized by a Kurdiakus, and said, write a get for my wife. We consider it as if he didn't say anything. So the Gemara says, what is this Kurdiakus? Kurdiakus? What is Kurdiakus? Overcame somebody? Kurdiakus? What is it? He got a cold? And why don't we consider what he said? He said he wants to divorce his wife, give her a get. But if he has Kurdiakus, no. So what is this, like a spiritual asthma? Barah says, no. Kudiakus is a type of demon. Kudiakus is a type of demon that goes into a person. You can call it a divuk. But it comes as a result of a person drinking a lot of wine. Large quantities of fresh wine. So if this person is possessed by some type of demon, and he says that he wants to divorce his wife, or anything that he says. We don't take it uh, seriously. We ignore what he says, because obviously, he's not in control of himself. So then the Gemara continues, on page 68a, and says, okay, we learn about this called Yakus. What else is there? Gemara says, oh, there's a lot. There's a whole lot. What's a lot? Rabbi Yochanan says, there was a town that had 300 demons, 300 different types of demons, in a town called Shichin. Meaning that there are different types of demons. It's not just one type of demon, one size fits all. There are ones that look like people, their flesh, some are completely spiritual, some are partial spiritual, partial uh, uh, flesh. They have different roles, different abilities, and even different food between each other that could sustain them to allow them to live. They have different names. Why do we need the names, says the Gemara? Because if somebody has a demon enter him, the time when there were people that were holy enough and knowledgeable enough like Rabbi Yudaftaya that was able to force these demons to come out, one of the things that was necessary was to know the name, the name of this demon. Because when you make an amulet, you make a a kamea, you need to have the name. There was a woman that came to Rabbi Yudaftaya, he mentions this in his Ruchot Mesaprot, it's a Minchat Yehuda Sefer, that uh, she had a dream that uh, the fruit that she ate was a, uh, some person was in it. But he said, thank you, but uh, you could have done better if you did a better bracha, if you did a better blessing. And she wanted to ask the rabbi, is this real? And the rabbi said, yeah, 100% it's real. This is a person that had to be reincarnated as a result of his sins inside a fruit and the way to elevate him was a... Uh, You had to make a blessing on the fruit, and you did, but you made the wrong blessing. So you helped him, but not completely. Fine. We're going to go into the reincarnation part in a little while. But first, we have to go into this world of demons. What does that have to do with intimacy? What does that have to do with nega? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to David, David, when your son Shlomo doesn't act well, I'm going to send him demons. Yeah, but the Gemara says that Shlomo HaMelech was the most powerful king that ruled over everyone, not just the nations, but also the animals and even the demons. He ruled over everyone. Everyone had to submit to him. So the Gemara says the following. Shlomo HaMelech 
provided, he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 8, I provided myself with masculine and feminine orchestration, with delights of mankind, and with shida and shidot. Shlomo Amelech says, I provided myself with all of the finer things, the musical instruments, the delights of mankind, pools and baths, but also shida and shidots. What shida and shidots? Male and female demons. So can I ask, why? Why does Shlomo HaMelech write in Ecclesiastes that he, this is one of the things that he used. He had these demons. Male, female. And Gemara says, since he was the ruler of all, he had them do his bidding. He needed them to do stuff. So they did. And Gemara says, the primary example. The time came and Shlomo wanted to build the Bet Mikdash. To build the Bet Mikdash, you couldn't just build a building to be big, to be square, to be rectangle, to be whatever you want it to be. It had to meet the exact specifications. One of the specifications is that you were not allowed to use steel, including as a tool. You weren't allowed to cut the rocks with steel so how do you cut anything if not with steel needless to say huge boulders huge rocks mountains how do you do it so Shlomo HaMelech with his wisdom he knew that there is a special animal that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created called Shamir the Shamir was a uh really a sea creature, lived in the sea, but was able to live in both. It was a tiny, tiny little thing. The Gemara in Masechet Sotah, page 48b, says that the Shamir worm was the size of a barley corn. It's tiny. And Moshe Rabbeinu used it in order to make the ephod for the Kohen, you had to have these special clothing that had these stones on it. And you weren't allowed to engrave the stones because that would lessen the stone. So you had to engrave the names of the tribes on the stone without engraving the stone. Meaning, you had to engrave it, but without lessening the material. Which means that you had to cut the stone not shave it like they do today and the only way to do that was with this shamir worm that would in so many words it had the equivalent of radioactive rays coming out of it that was able to part any stone anything stone steel whatever Moshe Rabbeinu used it and Shlomo HaMelech knew about it now the key was to find it he commanded the demons to come to him and he said where is this worm and they said well, we don't know this uh, this this worm is not something that we have uh, a possession of but maybe the king of the demons Ashmedai maybe he knows so Shlomo HaMelech says to them where is he he said oh he he has a uh, whole regiment. He lives far away by the mountains where he dug for himself a pit filled with water. Now, this is not regular water. This is water that is fit for him and him only. It's, it's a, you could call it spiritual water, but it's actual uh, something that uh, is equivalent to water, but not water that uh, is the water that we're familiar with. Only he could drink it because the moment somebody else would tamper with it, it would no longer be suitable for him. So he made himself some type of a hole uh, near this mountains where he filled it with this water and he goes up to the heavens every day deals with the things of heaven and then to satiate himself he comes back every so often to get some uh, to uh to this uh place it's sealed with a special 
uh, signet that he puts on it. If he sees that somebody messed with the seal, he knows that this is tempered with, he has to leave. But if, as long as nobody touched it, he opens it up, he drinks, and then he flies away again. So now, Shlomo Melech knows that this Ashmedai, obviously he didn't come, so he's not looking to listen to Shlomo. He's a king himself. So he has to capture him. Shlomo takes the head of the Sanhedrin. The head of the Sanhedrin was a tzaddik named Benayahu ben Yehoyada. Benayahu ben Yehoyada was the Ish Kodesh, head of the Sanhedrin, knew endless amount of Torah, but that wasn't enough to go deal with this demon. So Shlomo HaMelech taught him and gave him certain tools that were supernatural in order for him to be able to go capture this Ashmedai. The demons told him where he is. He went over there. He found the place. And he knew that he had to trap him. He couldn't handle him one-on-one. So Shlomo HaMelech gave him a special chain that had the name of God on it. Not just the Yud Kevav Ke the Shem Havaya, but the full name that is a uh, a name that uh, in so many words submits anything and also uh, uh, can uh, you could do all types of supernatural things with it then he gave him some other tools that he's able to do things that are not uh, uh, regular things of this world but also he gave him some uh, uh, wine, but it wasn't regular wine. Wine that could be suited, could be in so many words prepared to be like in the level of the spiritual water of the demon. But how do you get this demon to drink this wine? So Benayahu ben Yoyada acted quick, made a cave under this uh, this uh, 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 pit. In there, he made a hole to drain out the water that the Ashmedai had. After that, he sealed it with cotton balls. Then he made another hole, another cave, that he could make, uh, connect a tube between the two where he could put in this wine and refill this pit for the, for the demon with the wine without him seeing anything broken because the seal is not being touched. And then after that, wait on the tree, wait for him to come. Shortly later, he comes, checks the uh, pit, everything is good, nothing is sealed, opens it up, oh, surprised. Why? It's wine. Although it's wine for him, it's wine that's suitable for him, it's wine that could sustain him, it's this type of spiritual wine, but it's a uh, wine nonetheless, and he knows that wine leads to problems. So initially he chooses not to drink it, but then he's, the Gemara says he's too thirsty and he decides that he has to and he drinks it and he loses some of his abilities, his strength, and immediately Ben Ayahu Ben Yoyada jumps on him and puts the chain with the special name of Hashem on him around his neck. So when he wakes up and he tries to fight back, he tells him, you can't. The name of Hashem is on you. You're now my prisoner. You're coming with me. What do you want from me? He says, T- give me the Shamir worm. He goes, I don't have the Shamir worm. This is not something that I have. He says, who has it? He says, the Shamir worm is a, uh, is, belongs to the master of the sea, the master of the ocean. He owns it. He says, okay, where is it? Where does he keep it? He says, he doesn't keep it. He gives it to a, uh, a bird that lives in a desert. Some say it's a, uh, a wild, um, a wild chicken that's not kosher, a wild cock. And some say that it's a, uh, a duchifas, which is a, uh, a wild peacock. A regular peacock is kosher, by the way, but a wild peacock is not. He says, why does he give it to him? He says, because this, uh, this duchifas, it, uh, swore that it's going to preserve this uh this shamir worm this special worm until you know when whenever he asks for it so what does he use it for 
oh, it needs it in order for it to survive because it needs to, you know, break mountains anytime there's no food in the desert. It puts this worm over a mountain, it breaks it, then it drops some seeds in there, and then this uh, produces food. So this Shamir worm is like his most prized possession. That's how it lives. Okay. The, uh, this comes back to Shlomo HaMelech. Shlomo HaMelech sends somebody to go capture this, uh, uh, this uh, special worm, finds this special bird, sees this bird, traps the bird in a very clever way by putting a mirror over her, uh, not a mirror, a glass over her eggs. She can't get to her eggs, to our, to our children. And it's confused at what's happening. They scream to scare her away, which automatically makes her drop the worm that's always in her mouth. They grab the worm and run away. And the Gemara says that once this uh, chicken, this wild cock, uh, or duchifas it's called, uh, was uh, uh, saw what happened, it killed itself. Because it broke the vow that it made to the master of the, uh, of the ocean. Now, of course, I know that some of these stories are hard for some people to understand, believe, whatever it is, but this is what it is. And as I mentioned, these are not just stories in the, uh, in the air. These, are ha- these stories have sources in the Torah, Ecclesiastes, the book of Samuel, and, 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 and multiple other places. Now, up to now, we understand why Shlomo needed demons and how he used them. But David Melech was told that Shlomo Melech will be hurt by demons, rebuked by demons. So the very same Gemara continues and says that Shlomo captured this uh, king of the demons, Ashmedai, for years until he completed building the Bet HaMikdash. And then one day when they are alone, Shlomo asks him, what, uh, what makes you better than people? What qualities do you have? I understand the Torah says that the angels and the demons are great. I understand why the angels are greater than us, but what makes you greater than us? So this Ashmedai says, well, I can't do anything because you have this chain on me. Remove it, and then I'll show you. Shlomo makes the mistake of listening to him, removes the chain. The second he removes the chain, the uh, Ashmedai takes that part of Hashem's name and swallows it. And then he throws, or some say kicks, Shlomo Amelech with a demon kick that doesn't kill him, but makes him fly away 400 parsa. 400 parsa is a... Uh, something like a couple thousand miles or more, maybe over a thousand miles. Long, long, far away in so many words. And then the demon changes his shape and pretends to be Shlomo HaMelech for several years until Batsheva, the mother of Shlomo, discovers this, which we'll discuss perhaps at another time. The point being here is that we see that apparently Shlomo HaMelech made a mistake, not just with the demon. We're talking about a mistake that happened before the demon. A mistake that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to send him a message, a message of rebuke. And therefore he allowed this demon to hurt him and kick him out of his own kingdom for seven years. This was the rebuke that King David was told was going to happen to his son if he doesn't behave according to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says. Now, here we see that this negaim are not just physical afflictions of skin disease, STDs, mental issues, spiritual issues. No, no, no. We see that these negaim can also be afflictions where a person that is immoral, a person that is doing things that are the opposite of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, the opposite of what 
the Ramban here is giving us details, some of the afflictions can literally be supernatural creatures torturing a person in their dream, torturing a person in their real life. A person can have constant dreams of things that are immoral, which causes him to waste seed. Even though while he's awake, he's protecting himself, he doesn't look, but he constantly has these dreams. When we get to uh, Alakha, we see that there's Alakhot about everything. There's laws about everything, including how to sleep. And Shuchan Aruch paskins that you're not allowed to sleep on your back. Some Chachamim are even stringent enough to say that you're not even allowed to lay on your back. But the Alakha is not as difficult. The Alakha is you're just not allowed to sleep on your back. Now, if a person falls asleep, and obviously he loses control of his body, he doesn't know what he's doing because he's sleeping and is, he ends up waking up and he's on his back, that's a different story. That's not a, that's not a problem. We're talking about electively choosing to go to sleep on the back, not allowed to do so. Why? Chachamim say because this is forbidden because according to the sages, when a person sleeps on his back, he is enticing the Satan's wife to come and take what she wants from him. Come and take what gives her life and power, even greater than the Satan himself. When a man lays on his back, this is something that usually happens only when he's asleep. He gets attacked. In the form of a dream, sometimes even without a dream, because she wants to take the seed out of him, because she, in essence, creates more of these creatures in the world, more of these demons in the world. This is also why on Yom Kippur, when we do the vidui, the Nisi, uh, Rav Nisi Magadol, the, the the big vidui, the uh, vidui Gadol, I should say, the vidui Gadol. Anyone that actually read it and understand what it says, sees it literally, the whole thing is about acts of immorality that we're repenting for, that we're apologizing for. And then it says, in a section in there, it says that, please Hashem, forgive us for any seed that left our body, either through our own hands or the hands of others. Ben Yedai, who is this Acherim? Who is others? Others is the demons. Others is a person goes to sleep and has a dream that creates all types of problems for him while he's awake even. This also happens to women. We ask Hashem to not forgive us but to fix this, fix this problem. Why? Because once these things are out there, they have all types of abilities and all types of uh, inclinations to torture us. The natural inclination of these creatures is to destroy. This is why the Gemara says that while uh, Ben Eyao was uh, dragging, the, uh, bringing uh, Ashmedai to Shlomo Melech, this was a journey, Along the way, Ashmedai was destroying a bunch of things, destroying houses, destroying uh, trees, because the natural inclination of these things is to destroy. When there's a dibuk, for example, Rabbi Yudaftaya mentions it in Minchat Yehuda that the, uh, he would have to convince this dibuk not only to leave, but to leave without killing the person and without hurting the person in a big way. He had to hurt the person. There's no way for this demon to leave without hurting the person. But the, the one of the things that the uh, uh, that Rabbi Daftai would force him to do, and other mekubalim that dealt with it would have to do, would force him to cause the least amount of damage, which is by forcing him to leave, usually through the small toe or the uh, big toe. Because if they leave through the mouth, that person will never be able to speak again. If they leave through the eye, the person will go blind. They leave through other body parts, the person dies. 
Even though the demon leaves, the person dies with it. So, the uh, one of the things that the uh, Mekubalim would do, while literally exercising these things out of people, whenever they happened, was also force them to leave in certain ways, because their natural inclination is to be destructive. So, when a person wastes seed on purpose, they're literally creating an army of enemies for themselves. An army of enemies for themselves. An army of enemies that will cause the person to make mistakes at work, make mistakes in their marriage, make mistakes in their relationships, make mistakes in, in all types of things. An army that will incline them to be more, uh, more enticed by sin. Now, when a person does it, but not on purpose, he fell asleep, but he fell asleep on his back, and things like that uh, uh, produced, the seed is wasted, it also creates, even though it's not near, nowhere near as damaging as him doing it on purpose while he's awake, it still creates a problem. You know, people always ask me, oh, listen, this happened to me, is this bad? Well, it's not good, but it's nowhere near as bad as, uh, as doing it on purpose. Doing it on purpose, let's say, is level 1,000. Doing it while you're falling asleep, so long as you didn't cause yourself to dream these things and see these things because of the things you watch during the day, it could be, you know, a very, very low level. But needless to say, it's still a problem. A person still has to do a tikkun for it. This is also the reason why even tzaddikim say the same vidui during the holy days about this seed. If it's not for now, it's for the previous years, for the uh, earlier years, for times that there was a... Uh, uh, you know, the person was younger or not uh, uh, unaware, all types of things. Now, the Chachamim um, say that these types of things certainly exist, these types of things certainly impact our reality, but there are other things also that exist that if a person actually saw them, they wouldn't want to eat. And that actually goes back to the reincarnations. The Buddha of Taya tells us that uh, there was a woman that came to him that uh, had a dream about uh, the, the vegetable that I mentioned earlier. But the Arizal says this is obviously a, a, a common thing where there are people that uh, part of their rectification, their tikkun, their punishment, combination of all thereof, is to be reincarnated in foods. And in fact, the holy books say that many times people reincarnate into the food that their own family members are about to eat. Hence the reason why if you knew everything that was around you, everything that's everywhere, you wouldn't want to eat. Because you could be eating an apple, an orange, a sandwich, and your uncle is in there. Your father is in there your brother is in there your grandfather is there now why is this a uh, why is this done it sounds vicious no rather because if a person is aware of this a person is supposed to learn Torah and thereby learn this stuff if a person is aware that it could be his brother in there it could be his father in that fruit it could be his mother it could be his uh whatever somebody that's significant to him in that food that in itself is going to make the person much more motivated to do whatever they can to help them. So how can you help food? Not just by eating it, but by making a blessing with a lot of kavana. When you're eating, you're about to eat that sandwich. Instead of just eating because you're hungry, instead of eating that apple because you want something sweet, Instead of eating that banana because you want something to satiate you without eating a big meal. Instead of eating whatever you're about to eat just because it's nutritious. You're eating because you figure, wait, hold on a second. I have the ability to help whoever is in this thing. And whoever is in this could very well be somebody that I love. Somebody that's close to me. Somebody that's important to me. I can help them. Elevate them to a higher level, to a better level. So a person is going to think, you know what? I'm not eating just for me eating. I'm eating because there's a purpose behind my food. I'm going to make a better blessing on this because that's going to help both of us even more. This is also, by the way, why 
some mekubalim would only eat or would often eat the eyes of fish. But just the eye, not the entire fish. Because there are certain neshamot that reincarnate only in the eyes of fish, not in the rest of the fish. So because these mekubalim, these tzadikim, they don't eat because they're hungry. They don't eat because people eat. They eat because they want to be part of tikkun olam, the part of the rectification of the world. They want to help. So they would eat these specific eyes of fish just for the sake, of course, kosher fish, just for the sake of helping whatever neshama that's in there elevate itself. Now, the average person hearing this, of course, thinks most likely I'm insane, thinks this is insane, interesting but insane, I'm far away from it, where is this guy, I'm not eating eyes of fish, I'm barely going to make a blessing, the guy's thinking to himself, we know. We still teach some of this stuff, number one, for a person to understand how great, how much greater the Torah is than us. Where we could aspire to, what's available out there, which we're not even touching the surface. But it's always important for a person to know how much greater the Torah is them, how much greater the sages are from him. Even if you're, you know, you hear things that are well, well above and beyond your pay grade, it's always good to know that there's a lot of room to grow. The second thing is also that even if a person can't reach the heavens, if they have the clarification, the understanding that there is a long way to go, there's a good reason to go, there's a amazing ways to go, they're still going to try to do better than what they're doing now. So even if you don't get to the moon, you can still land on the clouds. You can still land on a, oh, at least a roof of some big building, spiritual building. Anything is better than staying where we are today. All of us, all of us have to grow. Now, one of the things that the Ramban is telling us is that this food is a very, very big deal. And one of the things that a person now learns that it could be that the next time they eat, they could be saving one of their family members from a sentence in Gehenom. They could be saving one of their family members for another five, ten years of being in something that doesn't have life. How? The type of blessing, the kavana. The meaning, the intent behind each blessing. This is also why sometimes a person can be perfectly religious, learned, everything is going okay, but all of a sudden, he gets angry. Or it could be an average person, everything is going good, but all of a sudden, he thinks all types of heretical thoughts. Or he starts having a potty mouth, starts cussing. What happened? Well, very simple. Somebody did something bad in the world. He said something terrible, said something heretical, said something vulgar. Those words didn't just go nowhere. Those words are in the air. You don't see it, but it's there. Those words from that filthy person, or at least the filthy mouth, go somewhere in the air. And eventually Hashem allows him to go into the drops of rain. That drop of rain hits the ground. It sustains and gives life to the fruits and the vegetables. You eat a salad that could very well have one of those drops in it. And all of a sudden... Even though you generally don't curse, even though you generally don't think about idolatry, even though you generally protect your eyes, all of a sudden you have these crazy thoughts in the middle of prayer, in the middle of a conversation with your wife, in the middle of a conversation with your husband. Where did this come from? I, I don't know why I'm thinking this. Thing. I, I don't know. I've never thought of such a thing. Usually people keep this stuff to themselves. Where did it come from? It came from what you ate. So how do you protect yourself? From spiritual germs? blessings if you make a good blessing 
before you eat, you remove all of those spiritual germs. All of those germs that I just mentioned, that go from some filthy potty mouth, that go into the water, that go into the fruit, that go into the vegetable, that go into your mouth, all of that can affect you so long as you didn't do a blessing. The minute you did a blessing, the right way, the right blessing, you've cleaned out all of those spiritual germs. And now you also have the ability to help whatever is inside the fruit too, inside the vegetable too, inside that piece of meat too. This is why the more righteous people didn't care so much about food because they viewed it from a completely different perspective. And one of the things we learned about Rav Edelstein, Alava Shalom, is that his own sons gave us literally such musar about how do you get to be someone that Hashem chose to be a gdolado. There are many people that are learned. There are many people that are popular. There are many people that are smart. But Hashem only chooses a few to be accepted as a gdolado. There's no election. There's no uh, any type of popularity contest. Whoever's a gadol, everyone knows he's a gadol. Even the one that hate him, even the one that loved him, even the one that are against what well, doesn't make a difference. Everyone knows he's a gadol. How do you become a gadol? Aside from toiling in Torah, sacrificing for the sake of Ami Sled, what else? Well, let's see. The sons of Arab Elstein said they knew that. Their Abba was different than the people that he helped. How so? They said, when Abba asked for tea, we knew that just simply meant hot water. How do we know it's hot water? Because one time somebody brought tea to the Rav because he asked for tea. And as soon as he got it, Rav Edelstein says, what is this? Like I said, it's tea, for the Rav. This is tea. He said, yeah. So why is it that color? He says, with the Rav, it's, you know, tea. You have the tea bag. I don't know, you have whatever tea bag you like, the, the blueberries, the cranberries, the, the black tea, the blue tea, the green tea, whatever tea flavor you like. Perhaps a few little uh, cubes of, uh, of sugar, maybe a couple of spoons of sugar, whatever your, your uh, preference is. Put them together. Makes a nice little colorful. There you go, that's tea. Rav Elstein says, who decided that's tea? If you want something to warm your body, just heat the water. That's tea. That's tea too. Hot water. There's no need for this extra. Why do I need it to have a certain color? That's just lust for, for, for all types of wasteful things. Sugar? For what? Why do I need it to be sweet? So for him, for Rav Edelstein, tea, hot water. The kids also said, Abba, who they grew up with, raised by, Part of Kalal Yisrael was raised by him. He helped endless amount of people build homes, build lives. His own kids grew up in a house where they knew Abba, he eats the remains. What does it mean he eats the remains? You know, everybody gets food. They weren't exactly rich. Everybody gets their food. You go to school, you get a little sandwich. Whatever is left of the sandwich, you know, everybody comes home with whatever remains. I don't know, a little grain over here, a little quarter of a sandwich there, a little small pieces, whatever everybody, the kids of the house got. The Rabbanit takes the remains, puts it in water, puts all this bread, whatever it is, whatever is remaining, puts everything in water, in so many words, completely destroying any decent taste that it still had left, if it had any decent taste left puts it in water and then you go to the Rav Rav Edelstein here you go is the food not one meal 
not for two meals, not for one year, not for two years, not for five years, not for ten years. Food, whatever is there, put it in water so it doesn't require too much bodily effort not to chew it, not to digest it. And just put it, swallow, finished. Follow a hundred years like this. Rabotaye Kareem. Things that we wouldn't even imagine doing were standard, our standard, to Gdole Israel. This is the same way that Rav Steinemann, Allah Shalom, used to eat the same thing. Simple, they would put whatever food it was just to put it in water, make it completely unedible in the eyes of most people. But to them, okay, satiated, okay, I can have enough energy to go serve Hashem now. Now we're not at this level, we're not even recommending for you to be at this level, but we're simply trying to see where are we, where are Gdolei Israel, why are they Gdolim? Well, the question is not really so much why they gdolim. The question is, why am I not? While he was willing to eat everything and anything as long as it simply doesn't require much bodily effort and it's kosher, of course. Most people, you tell them tea. It has to be done in a certain way. Make sure to put only one and a half sugars. Not two, that's too sweet. One and a half sugars. You know what? One and a quarter sugars. You give them the tea. Oh, you put one and a half. Don't you remember I said one and a quarter? Oh, you taste the difference between one and a half and one and a quarter? Yeah, can, can you do it again? What do you mean again? Can, can you make another tea? Oh, you mean throw this tea out? This perfectly fine tea? Throw it out? It's not perfectly fine. It has one and a half sugars. I want one and a quarter. You put too much milk in this coffee. You put... Too much this and this. You too much that. People literally have taste palates from Mars. If the meat is cooked one second extra, one second less, it's too rare, it's too done, it's too this, it's too that. Now again, I'm not saying I'm going to start eating uh, uh, Daisa. What I'm saying is we have to look at ourselves. What are we doing that we can do better? Do we spend too much time thinking about what we're going to eat? Do we spend too much time worrying about how everything is going to taste? Do we spend too much time just simply looking at acting as if material is God and forgetting that everything that God gave us is material we can use to serve Him and not to replace Him. Rabotai Karim, Gdolei Israel made it a habit to constantly look for more ways that they can serve a Kadosh Hu, to sanctify themselves by removing themselves from the norms of society and simply by removing themselves from the things that take up unnecessary energy and time food takes up a lot of time in people's lives whether people are doing diets for the sake of health or people are simply just eating because they live to eat in both cases it's spiritually unhealthy it's spiritually unhealthy for you to spend a quarter of your day worrying about what you're going to eat because you have to prepare all of these special salads and all of these special ingredients that you have to get from, I don't know, some country. You're putting too much effort into it. If you're, if you're preparing food for more time than you're learning Torah, there's a very serious problem here. When people put so much effort behind all of these different things, you see that You don't have to tell them they have to change. Life is going to do that for them because the results they're going to get are not going to be results they can be happy with. Whether those results are children they have or the results of simply their life, their marriage, their relationships, their happiness, their connection with the Creator. There's a new plague in the world today 
where people are taking all types of psychedelics, drugs, but they're telling themselves that they're taking these psychedelics in order to get closer to God, and some of them even say, I got closer to God as a result of this delusion, illusion, and all types of things that are forbidden according to all opinions of the Torah. Yeah, but what if this forbidden psychedelic got me closer to God and now I'm studying better? That's a mitzvah from the Satan. The Satan got you so much that he makes you think that the sins are good. That's how good he is. Why do you think the Satan is something you don't mess with? Satan is not asking you to kill yourself. Satan is simply asking you to make one small little sin. Go to this place. Look at this thing. Eat this thing. Touch this thing. Consume this small thing. He's asking for smaller steps. Why? Because the Satan knows once you touch the forbidden, you're addicted. Hence the reason why the, the ultimate secrets of the Torah tell you the secret behind what is the Satan? What is he called? The Satan is called Samich Mem. Samich Mem spells Sam, which means drugs. You think you're going to connect to God through psychedelics, through marijuana, through all types of plants. You're simply so deep in the grip of the Satan that you don't even realize that you're a prisoner. Sometimes people try to serve Hashem in a new way, in an innovative way, because they are looking for some type of ecstasy. Anyone that has followed this series and quite frankly, any of the other lectures we've given over the years, especially the series, is, over a period of time and applied as many of those things to their life over a period of time, I can assure you, one after another, felt both physically, spiritually, and other ways, elevated no less than any high in the world can give you. Only difference is, they did it in a permissible way, and they did it in a way that doesn't destroy lives, doesn't destroy eternity, and it's also something that doesn't go away. It stays, it grows, takes a break, it grows further. Takes a break, grows further. The Ramban is telling us, if we want to elevate ourselves we don't need drugs. We don't need psychedelics. We just simply need to look at the things that we do in our life. How we eat, what we eat, when we eat, why we eat, why we do what we do. What's the purpose? The more you look for a purpose behind everything, the closer you are to finding God. And the closer you are to getting the results that God wants to give you. Thank you for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of us to, at the very least, get the inclination, desire to aspire for more. And if we aspire for more, we're already halfway there. B'chabat, the Hashem, we'll see each other tomorrow.